a decree was issued to form an investigative committee on the Tweet Gok Dinka conflict, as well as the Lear incident. What have been the outcomes from the committees? Join us as we discuss this and more only on Beyond the Headlines. We are joined on the program by Mr. Edmund Yakani, the Executive Director of CEPO. Welcome to Beyond the Headlines. Yeah, thank you. And I'm honored to be again for uh, your interview. And thanks also to your audience who are listening wherever they are. Finally, the report of the investigation of Twitch and Ngong Denka has been published. What is your take on the report? Um, I appreciate the committee have done their work and they have made their deadline given by the presidential decree which established the committee. I think the committee, the, the, the report of the committee is remarkable. At least the, the report have reflected all what I wish to appear in the report in terms of factors that trigger the violence between the Twitch and the Ngok Dinka and the players behind it and the consequences. And also the recommendations of the report have gone more deeper to the recommendations that I wish to such recommendations. So I treat the, the report as a remarkable, as a report that is credible and report that have reflected the reality on the ground. Our next question is now whether the recommendation will be implemented or not. That's become our next um, area of where we need to track and we need to watch what will the leadership of the country take. The Secretary of ANIT Intercommunal Investigation Committee was the National Minister of Investment, Du Mathok Ding Wall. Among the findings of the committee was that the committee noted that the SSPDF in Majakol and Romkur barracks failed to contain the situation which led to insecurity that resulted in the loss of lives and properties because they had identified themselves with their communities. The committee observed that the presence of UNISFA on the ground limited the role of SSPDF in providing security in the area, especially in Abye area. In addition, UNISFA failed to carry out its duties of protecting the civilians in ASAA as mandated by status of force agreement, SOFA. The committee also found that Publications written by Honorable Bona Malwa and Abye intellectuals, including Honorable Dr. Francis Mading Day, fueled the conflict. In your opinion, have all the issues been covered as it relates to the conflict between the Twitch and Long Dinka? Yes, I think it's covered. First, it's, it's covered like where the problem started and why the problem started at this particular particular moment, and who are the people who trigger that problem, and who are the people who fall it more, and who mobilized the youth, and how the youth were mobilized. And even not only youth, members of two communities who are in uniform, how they are mobilized, and how they are directed to really commit atrocities that we have seen. So I think for me, the report have covered what I wish the report to cover. So I'm impressed with the report. Mm -hmm. In summary, what are the key findings of the report? And do you believe those findings will be honored by all the parties that are involved in conflict? In summary, the findings of the report is that one, there's a tension over issue of land, this land boundary, which have never happened in history of Twitch and Ngok Denka. But also if you read the report into in-depth, it's actually the question of political competition between the political elites from Twitch and Ngok Denka that has pushed the young people to fight simply because they have their personal grievances and they reflect their personal grievances in forcing the communities to fight. And that's why you see that there's a prominent names of individuals being named that these are the individuals. And if you look at the report, you can see their letters that they have written to their committee members. So those are the triggers. So the land competition is a cover, but actually the political elites are the one behind the violence. They have their own problems, but they have to reflect this problem by really pushing the communities to fight and kill each other, while the communities benefit nothing out of that because of their personal problems that they cover under the name of competition over a boundary of land. So I think that the report I've covered. The question whether the report would be honored or not be honored, the question is the people who are named in the report to be individual behind the conflict are close ally of his excellency, the president. I hope the president will take a very 
uh, instrumental action, either calling them or warning them to distance themselves or even discipline them. Because I think this is a time where we don't need to compromise with rule of law. Rule of law have to prevail in the context of um, the crisis that has happened between Twitch and Mokadenka. So I hope that President would honor because these close allies were mentioned in the report for fueling the crisis between the communities of Twitch and Mokadenka, which have led to loss of lives and destruction of properties. There was a similar committee established by the president on lear violence, but it seems nothing has come into fruition uh, from the committee itself. What do you know about the investigative committee on the lear violence? The committee on lear violence up to now have never delivered what is expected from them by the presidential decree that established the committee for investigating the violence in Lair. You know, violence happened in Lair, which I describe as a crime against humanity and committed by men in uniform against the civil population of Lair County. And president has established a committee. The committee mandate have come to an expiration. The committee is quiet. The committee is not speaking out whether their mandate is renewed or not renewed because their mandate expired during the festival of the Ramadan season of the Muslims until now. The committee is quiet. We've never heard from them anything, and they're not updating us like the way how the Twitch and the Ngokdinka committees to perform. They used to keep the public updated, and they used to press statements or they call for press conference. This committee of LER have never ever called for press conference or have never informed the public where they are. So I'm really completely ignorant of what's happening with the committee. Mm -hmm. But to the best of my knowledge and to the best of my sources that are around the committee, is that even the members of the committee are really in dispute in, 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 in accomplishing their mandate. So, and that comes where sometimes when you form a committee to investigate such crises, when part of the members of the committee are also implicated in the conflict, always make the committee look to move further because they want to water down the mandate of the committee. So I think that's a challenge to the lead committee. And we have seen similar committee been established by the governor of Central Equatorial State, Adil Emanuel, to tackle Kajukeji. I hope that the Kajukeji committee will be completely composed of neutral people who may not drag the investigation into such crisis. So lay committee is dragging its feet to investigate the situation and render a report, which is more remarkable like the report of Twitch and Mokodenka committee. What update do you have for us on the incident that took place in Kajukeji with the killing of three unarmed civilians by SSPDF soldiers. And what do you think about the plan investigation that has been called for by Governor uh, Emmanuel Adel? I, I, I really am impressed that the CDF, the Chief of Staff of the uh, South Sudan People Defense Force immediately wrote to His Excellency Governor Emmanuel Adel to form a committee to investigate the atrocities committed by the members of South Sudan People Defense Force against the three civilians. And remember also, there's quite a number of 11 civilians were arrested and more than 14 were beaten. About 14 phones were confiscated. They only returned two phones for those citizens who have offered them beer. They have taken along with them 12 phones. So a committee was formed to investigate these atrocities. And of course, what I know is that at least per now, Three of the civilians who are released is still we have civilians who are in the three world releases. One of them is a lactating mother because you have a child, you have to really take care of the child because the child suffered almost like two days without having breastfeeding. So that is the situation we're in. And of course, so we are aware that the youth who have participated in providing information to the public domain with regard to the incident that happened in Kajukeji, they are now on run because the members of South Sudan People's Defense Force, or whether it's the MI or individuals, are really targeting them. They don't take away their lives. Some of them, their house were attacked. So they are now on run. They're not in Kajukeji, and they have reported publicly that their lives is under threat. Of course, a committee have to be established by Governor Emmanuel Adil. My call is that such committee have to be committee composed of the neutral members and of course SBDF to be there, but also which such committee should be inclusive, involving uh, elders, involving religious leaders, involving civil society, to make sure that at least we have a credible, inclusive investigation like what happened in uh, Twitch and Mokodinka Investigative Committee. So I like I will start to be there. How the committee investigation will be, it depends on the will of the governor. If the governor wants to deliver like what the Twitch and the Ngokdenga committee have delivered, the government have the prerogative, have all the responsibility to facilitate the committee financially, to facilitate the committee to meet deadline in terms of timing. So that's what I'm thinking. Whether the investigation will be credible, I hope the investigation will be credible in the sense that at least this is a clear incident that the leadership of South Sudan People's Defense Force have acknowledged that some of their members have committed trust against the civilians. And even the commander on the ground, Kajukeji, have done a tremendous work he have arrested the five suspected soldiers that committed trust against the three civilians. So I think, oh, I hope that that offer a will to investigate the incidents, but I hope that it should be done timely because sometimes such committees 
kill investigation. And that's why my call is that Governor Emmanuel Adel have to speed up the committee to go and investigate and render the report and justice must prevail. The same thing also I'm calling for justice to prevail in the, in the, in the Lerik incident, just to prevail in the Twitch and the Ngokdinka incident. Do you think there's a political will at the top leadership of the country that will take this report seriously and implement its findings? With the experience of previous similar committees that have done tremendous or remarkable work, always their recommendations are not implemented. So based on this, I would say there's a limited political will to deliver uh, such reports, findings. As I've said, if you look at the Twitch and the Ngok Denka, close allies of His Excellency the President, their, their names were mentioned. And always this investigative report touches people who are close to power. And that creates a personal fear from the top leadership of the country. And that make there's a limited political will to deliver. The only thing that what we know is that the political will, if those people are named in the report to be individuals who have fueled the violence, normally they either lose their political jobs, but it's rare for you to see them taken to court of law and held accountable so that justice prevail. That is my fear because our previous experience have shown us that similar committees have done similar work, but none of their recommendations were delivered. Their recommendation die naturally. The only thing you can see is a shift of individuals who are named boiling the violence, either shifting their political seats or they are kept to, reach, to remain in silence for a certain period of time, but normally they're rewarded also by having a new appointment. So we have never seen justice prevailing in such committees. And I, that's what I'm saying. Will I'm calling upon his excellence the president to take responsibility to make sure the recommendations of such committees are delivered. Because if you see the scale of the violence right now in the country is expanding, is in increase. Why? Simply because people have denied justice. And the moment where you deny people justice, injustice replace justice. And people are taking the law into the hand because they see the state is failing in providing justice. So they have to make sure that they protect themselves. And sometimes when they protect themselves, they protect themselves outside the law. So for me, it's really the top leadership of the country to take responsibility in delivering the recommendations of a such committees. But previous we have seen, they have not delivered. We have to decide they will deliver in order to make rule of law prevail. And that means peace will prevail and stability in the country. As a civil society activist, how will you ensure that the government takes this report seriously and implements its findings? Obviously, we keep on using platforms like yours in raising up our voices, in calling for the leadership of the country to implement the recommendations of this committee. And also we call on those who are tasked to engage in such committees to be honest and credible that they provide us accurate information. But of course, the next thing we're going to do is calling the parliament, specifically the national legislature, a meeting of the upper house and the lower house to discuss this report. Because if you see, for the last two weeks, the agenda of the national parliament is only based on motions on deadly in the communal violence. I've been watching our parliament almost one week the agenda, all their sittings is focusing on intercommunal violence. I think the leadership of the country is now under challenge. They have to make sure that they respond to that because the scale of the violence is getting up very badly. And as I'm talking with you right now, on the second of this month, the Anuak youth have clashed in, in Fochala County and we have lost life of five and some were injured. Now imagine if youth are start arming themselves to start fighting our armed forces, that is terrible. I think the leadership of the country, both at executive and legislative, you take up. So our responsibility as civil society is we'll keep on advocating and call them to take responsibility and implement the recommendation of such committees. Um, Mr. Edmund, uh, you've been you've been for a long time now advocating for enactment of law to mitigate this deadly uh, communal violence. Uh, what type of law are you proposing and will it help prevent the intercommunal violence that's been taking place across the country? Yes, you know, one of the things I've discovered that we have a lot of legal gaps in the country in managing deadly intercommunal violence. So my advocacy for the last almost one year now is that I'm calling upon the leadership of the country to enact what is called national law on mitigation of communal violence. Because this communal violence has so many factors. What we know is mainly cattle raiding or revenge attack or misbehaviors of our army. But these communal violence are triggered with competition of our resources, things like logging in Kajukeji things like competition over fishing points along river people, things like land grabbing, things like really arming cattle herders in order to impose their, their, their presence on certain communities' land. So I think all these factors have created deadly communal violence. So I think there's a need to bring a law or to enact a law 
that address these factors. And I feel the law should be much more on mitigating communal violence act. And this act will sanction some of the actions that might have constituted a crime against humanity. Because my word is that all these communal violence we're talking about for the last five years have really planted seeds of genocide. There's a chance is high that our communities may face genocide. Or actually, I may say pockets of genocide happen in the country, but we don't count on them. But if you bring all the incidents and you look at the patterns of all this communal violence, some of them are really crime against humanity. And the country is silent. Investigations are done by committees and the recommendations are ignored. So I want to see a law that will sanction products of such investigation not to be undermined. If it's undermined by the leadership today, the leadership of tomorrow will not undermine it. That's why I'm advocating for that law. Uh, lastly, it seems the situation in Tomara County is turning back to friction among the political elites in the country. Following the press statement issued by the Balanda dated the uh, June 3rd, 2022, accusing some Azanda politicians like the national speaker and the deputy governor of Western Equatorial State. In a statement released by Ukele Edi Gumas, chairman of the Balanda community of Western Equatoria State, it reads, while the idea of dialogue is welcomed, majority of people of Tombora County are very suspicious about the speaker's assertion of dialogue, including but not limited to first, her speech substantiates that of the Honorable Deputy Governor of Western Equatoria State. Second, the majority of people in Tombora County do not trust the speaker because after she visited Tombra County last year, the community feud ensued and people are panicking this time that the same situation could repeat itself again. Third, the majority of people of Tombra are very suspicious of her visit that it could be an aid or a helping hand to the few people who want to return Tombra back to anarchy. What is your take on the report that was released by the Balanda community? I was so disappointed, as you are aware, that I was really effectively engaging for quite a period of time to make sure that the, the Tombra community goes back to peace and stability. And we have succeeded to stabilize the situation in Tombra. The only solution that we're facing is really reconciling the communities, like the same thing we're now focusing at reconciliation among the Twitch and the Ngok Denka. But in, in Tombra in particular, the tension between the Balanda and the Zandes has come to really subside it. And now we have IDPs in Tombra that have to return back to the houses because we are in a rainy season, they have to go and farm and remember there's already an alarm raised by UNFAO and WP that the country may have a looming hunger coming. So there's not enough money to help them with relief supply. So they need to go and farm. So um, White Honorable Speaker of the National Legislative Assembly and Deputy Governor of uh, Western Equatorial State visit the communities in Tombra, visit the IDPs, and they had conversation with the IDPs. So the best of my knowledge that the conversation is around how to return back to their communities. But of course, in that conversation, the Balanda say that they have had sentiments that have come from the two leaders and that they feel those sentiments is really furthering deficit in trust and confidence among the two communities. If you look at the statement, they seem more like accusing these two particular uh, political figures at national and state level. I'm not that accused them, I've seen them disagree in several statements. They, for me, the statement issued by the Balanda is disturbing. And that's why I want to call on the political elites of Azanda and Balanda, wherever they are, they should remain calm. They should allow the stability that is prevailing now in Tombora to continue, how much they have disputes among themselves. They should not translate their disputes to cause havoc among the communities. The communities need to survive. The communities need to pursue their lives. We should not take our political differences to the community level. So I will urge both communities that issuing of statement is a bit problematic. Okay. I would like to take this opportunity in your media platform to urge South Sudanese wherever they are, they should use social media in a responsible manner because with all these pockets of communal violence that I've talked about, ranging right from Twitch and Ngokadenka, the one in Lair, the one in Mayerdid, the one in Fachala, the one of Mag Mugale Kejukeji, there's an increase in hostile speech and, 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 and hate in the use of social media among South Sudanese. So I'd like to ask South Sudanese, let's abstain from using hate and hostile propaganda and even misinformation in terms of uploading wrong images for fueling crisis. I've seen an images that the incident happened either in Nigeria or in DRC are being used 
for describing incidents that are happening in South Sudan or using social media to verify whether this incident happened in South Sudan or not. But when you go to Google search, you come to realize that these pictures were being used somewhere before, but they've been used now by South Sudanese, whether they're in country or outside country on diaspora, to fuel more attitudes of violence among the population. So I would like to take this opportunity, calling South Sudanese wherever they are, please avoid promoting hate and hostile propaganda in various media platforms. Let's use media platforms to promote peace rather than violence. We've been joining the program by Mr. Enron Yakani, the executive director of CEPL. Thank you for coming on Beyond the Headlines. Yeah, thank you very much for hosting me. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page at Sunrise Media.